I've been thinking about forgiveness, I realize now, for um, slightly more than the whole of my adult life. Uh, my interest started on this in the 1980s. And I've been thinking about it uh, off and on and in various kinds of ways. And I actually thoroughly anticipate that I'm going to be thinking about it for quite a while longer. So I'm not going to offer you something today which suggests that uh, the issue of forgiveness, the puzzles, the agonies the subject creates for people can be resolved by me or actually anyone at this time. This is something more of a snapshot uh, into where I think uh, we are getting uh, in our bit of the world in thinking about this, this business. I'm going to um, talk, first of all, about the way in which Christianity uh, has engaged with and understands interpersonal forgiveness. I'm going to say uh, a little bit about God's forgiveness. And then at the, at, towards the end, I'm going to be saying rather more about self-forgiveness. Then I'll try and uh, make a few points uh, that I think sort of um, summarize some things that it's reasonable to say at this stage on this perplexing uh, but really important, I believe, subject. One of the strange things is that during much of the 20th century, philosophers were disinclined to engage with forgiveness precisely because of its associations with Christian piety. And they were very concerned, some of them, that their efforts might be seen as becoming sermonic, never mind parsonical. Christian preachers, of course, have often enjoined their congregations to forgive, but it's far from clear that their sermons have been as effective as they would like. The capacity for Christian people to remember and resent offences and to develop sectarian attitudes that settle into hatred and become violent are obvious enough and don't need narrating. One of the reasons for this may be found in a remark by C.S. Lewis, um, whom I will now uh, show you, I hope. C.S. Lewis in his uh, study. A remark he made in Mere Christianity, which was written shortly after the Second World War. He says that he tried on several occasions to encourage people to connect the Christian idea and practice of forgiveness with their attitudes towards those who had been their enemies during the recent war. But he found this really hard going. People didn't want to engage with him on this subject. He didn't have much success. This failure caused him to reflect and to remark that everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> That's certainly the way it is sometimes. But I wonder whether the opposite, or something like the opposite, happens too. Some people rarely think about forgiveness at all until something happens to them that does trouble them deeply and raises a profound question about the negative and hostile feelings that they suddenly find are welling up in themselves and with which they are not familiar. I recall vividly the occasion when the mother of a murdered teenager asked me whether or not she must forgive the members of the gang who were responsible for her son's death. As we were talking in a pastoral way inside a church building at the time, I took the view, and I still think this, that she was thinking that she would need to be able to forgive, she'd have to forgive her son's murderers if she wanted to be on good terms with God. Now, whether or not I'm interpreting that particular exchange correctly, this is definitely a line of thinking that has the force of both committed and what you might call softer or cultural Christianity behind it. For instance, uh, in October 2006, we go to the Nickel Mines Amish community in Pennsylvania. They suffered a terrible tragedy when a gunman imprisoned a dozen young girls in their school, killed five of them, wounded others, and then killed himself. The gunman was very local to the community, but not himself, a member of the community. But members of that community immediately rushed out to support and engage with and comfort the people in his family who were now bereaved and traumatized what had happened. 
They wanted to console and support them, as well as the families of the victims. This is some uh, a, a photograph. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's for real or a news photograph or from a film that was made about this. Now, what's very interesting from the forgiveness point of view is that members of this community believe that they had no choice but to offer such forgiveness in the aftermath of that atrocity. Their reason for thinking this uh, is to be found in the Bible, in particular in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6. Here, Jesus adds a gloss to the already challenging words of the Lord's Prayer. These words. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the gloss which comes after the prayer is written into Matthew's Gospel is this. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Now there are plenty of people who have taken this this imperative as the Christian view of forgiveness. The playwright and poet Charles Williams wrote about the terror of the little word as, which I have italicized there. Forgiveness of injuries is demanded of the Christian and it is demanded entirely, he wrote. A very different figure, R.T. Kendall, who was a very long-standing pastor of Westminster Chapel, wrote a book called Total Forgiveness, which proceeds along similar lines, uh, running off this uh, part of the Bible, one might say. For Kendall, forgiveness is the total eradication of bitterness, the merciful refusal to seek punishment, and the decision to keep no record of wrongs, to forget, if you like. For Kendall, unlike many Christian writers on this subject, forgiveness isn't connected to reconciliation. Indeed, he counsels that the forgiving person should not engage with the person whom they seek to forgive. In particular, not to suggest to that person that they are trying to forgive them. In his experience, this inevitably inflames the situation. Now, there is no doubt that Matthew's Gospel can be read in such a way as to encourage the view that victims must forgive. It's an imperative. But a rather different approach emerges if Luke's gospel comes into focus, where we find Jesus saying, if another disciple dis sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. The point here is that forgiveness is mandated, but it should not come immediately after the offense or the sin, but after sin and repentance. A different story. Now, before going in rather more detail into this question of forgiveness, or what you might call conditional uh, repentance or conditional forgiveness, as opposed to unconditional forgiveness, we should reflect on what is involved in any attempt to develop an ethic of interpersonal forgiveness from the New Testament. There are two factors to consider here. First is that the early Christian communities for whom these documents and by whom these documents were written, were places of friendship, fellowship, and solidarity. Where sins between brothers and sisters are mentioned or implied, they're almost certainly not life-changing or life-ending atrocities. We're not in the territory of the ty terrorist or the tyrant, or of what you might call traumatic harm here. So, care must be taken with ethical or sermonic extrapolation from the minor sins going on in the everyday life of the biblical communities to the aftermath of torture, abuse, or any kind of traumatizing harm that people may experience today. The second point is that in both the Gospels and the Epistles of the New Testament, there is the idea that forgiveness given by God to the average human sinner in the process of salvation is such a superlative and generous act that it creates the context in which Christian believers or disciples should really be prepared to see the sins and offenses against them as relatively trivial and act with such generous kindness towards each other 
that's another point. This is all insider forgiveness, uh, as it were, it, that is being understood. Act with such generous kindness towards each other as befits those who see themselves as recipients of generosity. So Paul writes to the Colossians that they must bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. <coughs> and we read similar things in <coughs> Ephesians, and in Romans, Paul writes, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So the idea is that well, obviously, obviously every, everyone is in a sinner, is a sinner. Uh, you're, there's a, there are echoes of that passage of, uh, from John's Gospel where uh, the authorities want to stone the woman, quotes, caught in adultery, and Jesus says, who, the person with the, without sin should throw the first stone. That's the kind, it's not precisely par parallel, but that's the kind of thinking which is going on there. One of, the, one of the issues we, we come up against, I think, in interpreting the New Testament and thinking how it might be relevant to uh, forgiveness in the aftermath of extremely uh, cruel and uh, traumatizing things happening is that there is quite a lot of hyperbole in the New Testament. And we move on, as we move on to another part of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 18, we find this in the form of the parable of the unforgiving slave. In this story, a slave who has had a huge, a ridiculously huge debt cancelled by his master takes a very mean attitude toward, towards a fellow slave who owes him very little. This hard-heartedness goes down very badly with the other slaves who report the matter to the master who replies, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy with you? But the unforgiving slave, I'm afraid, gets rather more than this dressing down. What happens next is, in his anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured so that he should pay his entire debt. Jesus immediately follows up this story with a further threat. So, my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Although we're not in the habit of handing over ungrateful beneficiaries of our generosity to be tortured, we can see the point behind the hyperbole here. When the sins inflicted on any individual and the consequent inconvenience are indeed relatively slight, we should be quick to forgive, especially if we recognize that our own standing and status today is only because we've been forgiven by others. But is this an imperative for every situation? It seems to me clearly not. Should others repeatedly harm us, violate our personhood in some way, oppress us, or cruelly abuse us, we are in very different territory. Again, the question of extrapolation of easygoing forgiveness to more traumatic circumstances is problematic. And it's perhaps right, I come to think, that C.S. Lewis was met by a combination of resistance and blank faces when he suggested that people think about how Poles might forgive members of the Gestapo in the early 1950s. People were intuiting that the offence was of a different order to those that they are normally able to forgive. They had a feeling that there is no off-the-peg model of forgiveness, no established habit or practice that they have which would fit the case. To put it another way, it's as if the virtue of forgivingness as they were living it, perhaps, could not stretch to the new circumstances. But is that a lack in them or a lack in their virtue, or is it a recognition that forgiveness is actually different in different circumstances? My suggestion here is, of course, the varieties of forgiveness. There are different forms of forgiveness that are uh, appropriate in different situations, and we get into significant trouble when we use the word only in this abstract and generic sense. I mean, we get into, we are into that trouble, both culturally and individually, when these uh, out-of-the-ordinary, extremely difficult things happen to us. 
and we have an ethic of how to cope with everyday offences. However, I need to go on a bit, what we might call the Christian case for forgiveness is significantly cranked up when the words of Jesus from the cross in Luke 23 are brought to mind. This is where the, G the crucified Christ says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a very famous phrase, and as you see, uh, is used on posters uh, and are in, in other encouraging ways to set a, a mindset, to make people think uh, it's really pretty important to engage with forgiveness if you are following in the footsteps of the Messiah who died on the cross. Now, these few words have ex received extensive discussion in recent years by those interested in forgiveness. And there's a few things going on. Some people seek to diminish their significance, referring perhaps to the point that these words actually don't appear in many of the earliest uh, manuscripts. So maybe they're not original words of Jesus at all, <coughs> would be the point. Some people say, well, actually, they're not an expression of forgiveness per se. They are, the philo a philosophical reading of this would be, these aren't, this isn't Jesus forgiving, this is Jesus finding reasons to excuse them because they didn't know what they were doing. Different thing altogether. And others would say uh, that actually the point of this is it's not a declaration of forgiveness. Jesus doesn't say, I forgive you. He prays for their forgiveness. Different idiom, different register altogether. Nonetheless, people do find them inspiring and motivating and take them to heart after they themselves had um, been put in a terrible situation. So it's not uncommon to hear Christian victims of violence who have sought to forgive those <coughs> responsible for their harm referring back to these very words and saying things like this, if Christ could forgive his killers, then I should be able to forgive those who have done this to me. A 15, uh, one of the occasions uh, which precipitated a lot of thought and reflection about forgiveness was the Enniskillen Remembrance Day bombing in 1987. And as I was reflecting earlier today on when I became interested in the subject, it was around about this time, so I've been wondering how much of an influence that actually was on me, consciously uh, or otherwise, at the time. One of the people injured in this was a 15-year-old boy called uh, Stephen Ross, uh, who was so damaged uh, that his face had to be, as it were, reconstructed, or the bones within it had to be brought back together. And he had to wear a, a cage uh, over his face for, for a year uh, until they knitted back together. So this is, this is a photograph of, of Stephen Ross uh, just uh, in the aftermath of this. He has spoken about his life subsequently uh, and is happy to use the language of forgiveness for the journey on which he has gone. And he does so referring to precisely these words of Jesus on the cross and using that phrase that I used just earlier. If Christ could forgive, I should be able to forgive. He says more than this when he talks about forgiveness, uh, be, get, making it clear that he realizes that without something like forgiveness, the anger uh, about it is in danger of taking, or you are in danger of the anger taking over your life and so dominating things that you don't yourself have any peace of mind or equilibrium. So he's, he's got more than one motivation, but the Christian side of him is very motivated by those words of Jesus on the cross. And you, if you look him up on uh, YouTube, you can find a, a talk in which he talks in this way. What's clear is that for him, significance uh, forgiveness really was a significant personal challenge. It didn't come naturally or instantly, but he committed to it and seems to have come through the experience with no, devi no desire for revenge and impressively little uh, bitterness. This idea that forgiveness is the word to be used when we describe the process of freeing ourselves from the negative emotionality of victimhood, in fact, goes back quite a long way. And people uh, attribute the origin of this to a man called Joseph Butler, uh, 
uh, who uh, worked in this part of the world in his early life and then became Bishop of Durham and other, took other great jobs uh, in the church as well, some of them all at the same time, of course. But in, in, when he was uh, here, or, or, uh, he wrote two and delivered two really important uh, sermons. They're bigger than sermons, they're, they're lectures, really. One was called Upon Resentment and the other Upon the Forgiveness of Injuries. The important thing is what he has to say about resentment, really, because he argued that it wasn't just a bad feeling, but a divinely implanted moral feeling, that it served a noble, ethical, or spiritual purpose, and therefore shouldn't be extinguished too quickly or easily, despite the fact that it's a very uncomfortable passion to live with. In fact, while plenty of people have put forward the idea that Butler proposed that forgiveness was, in fact, a forswearing, or the relinquishing of resentment, it's actually more true, if you make a detailed reading of what he wrote, to say that he saw forgiveness as the forswearing or the relinquishing of revenge, together with the rel relinquishing or refusal to adopt extreme forms of negativity or hatred. So I think it's fair to say that, he, that Butler would have expected your resentment to continue, but didn't want the resentment to go toxic, thought that's when it be, became wrong. So uh, forgiveness would be, a, as it were, a moderation and a, or control of resentment. Very different from what we were hearing about uh, earlier with the forgiveness as the idea of getting rid of, of all that or acting as if it, it wasn't there. Now, a neighbour of Stephen Ross in Enniskillen in 1987 is, was a man who did more than any, I think, to project the value of a forgiving spirit into the troubles of Northern Ireland. So we'll go back to the um, Enniskillen uh, bomb blast. Gordon Wilson, whose name you may recall, was holding his daughter Marie in his arms when she died of wounds sustained in the same bomb blast. In fact, we'll have a photograph of, of her, I think, um, rather than that. Um, and she died, and the last words she said were, I love you, Daddy. He came out of the, the middle of this. I mean, his ears were ringing uh, with the sound of the bomb, and his, obviously he would have seen all, all the carnage. Very quickly afterward, he, he, once he gave a short radio interview, the following day, he gave a more extended uh, interview on the Today program on Radio 4. I think what affected people who heard it uh, hugely was the calm and the dignity with which he spoke. But the particular words matter too. He said that he bore no grudge against the bombers and that he had no ill will. The Queen mentioned his example in her Christmas broadcast that year. But opinion was divided. Some thought it was wonderful some thought it was absurd that he could forgive so promptly. Others were enraged that he wasn't enraged. And others thought, who is he uh, to speak of forgiveness and pronounce forgiveness when I'm equally a victim and I don't feel that way at all? But it's important, I think, to recognize that he didn't use the language of forgiveness. He didn't pronounce forgiveness. And he didn't pretend to speak for others. He always used I sentences, as it were. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. No, no, no imperatives for anyone else in what he said. Or no pretense that anyone else was implied. But his prompt remarks do invite us to ask the question as to whether it is important that perpetrators of atrocities are manifestly repentant before any possibility of forgiveness arises. To put it bluntly... Not necessarily my view, but this is the, uh, the right question to ask, I think. Should Wilson not have had at least some ill will to those who callously murdered his daughter? Is that not an inevitable consequence of loving her? Should he not have resented her death as well as grieved it? It's a question that's in people's minds when they think about this. <coughs> The academic de debate about the need for repentance before forgiveness is an absorbing and somewhat strange one. It uses religious vocabulary, repentance, a religious word, but as featured more in the discussion of Anglophone North American and English philosophers and ethicists than it has among religious writers. 
The argument has been that for forgiveness to be ethical and just, moral and good, it shouldn't be granted to those who have not changed their attitude and behavior since they offended. The imperative driving this discussion is justice. The concern is that forgiveness if forgiveness removes from wrongdoers the consequences that follow from their inhuman actions in terms of opprobrium, punishment, and alienation, they will simply persist in their abominably harmful and unjust ways. Now, I'm going to change attack slightly here, change focus, and I will let, um, have a blank screen for a bit. Ecclesiastical authorities, I'm going to talk a bit about the church here, uh, responding to the crisis of sexu the sexual abuse of children and vulnerable adults by authority figures within the church, have also underlined the importance of repentance on the part of those who perpetrated such abuse. Interestingly, their focus isn't on interpersonal forgiveness, that of perpetrator by the victim or survivor, but on divine forgiveness, the perpetrator's desire to be forgiven by God, God's capacity to forgive. Repentance in this case is pivotal, and I'm quoting here. Turning to God to receive forgiveness also involves turning away from the wrong we have done. Responding to God's offer of salvation involves repentance as well as boundless thankfulness. Now that comes, I've quoted from this uh, small volume here, which is called Forgiveness and Reconciliation in the Aftermath of Abuse. It came out 2017, I think. It doesn't discuss how the perpetrator of abuse might go about seeking forgiveness from the victim survivor. But it does ask how the church should speak of forgiveness to those who have experienced abuse. Very important uh, question to ask. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, it takes a very different line to the version derived from Matthew's Gospel that I was speaking about earlier. The idea that it's imperative that victims remove every aspect of negative emotion from their heart as soon as they possibly can. The starting point, rather, here, is that the church should listen uh, to victims rather than preach to them. And it seeks to put individuals at ease if they find the Lord's Prayer petition, which we noted earlier, Father, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, if they find that difficult, threatening, or impossible. And it seeks to clarify that an ide idealized exchange model of forgiveness, where perfect resentment is matched by perfect repentance, leading to perfect forgiveness, is not the sort of thing that happens very often in real life. It asserts also that forgiveness isn't something that happens to order, whether by decision or as a result of a process, but that it may emerge from an ongoing struggle when a victim or survivor commits not to forgiveness per se, but to a struggle daily with the claims of justice and the claims of mercy. So it wants to have both of those things on the table at the same time and not to be too um, directive or bossy about how people deal with their own particular situations. An example of a case where forgiveness has not happened but where it may yet emerge, so forgiveness emerging is the idea uh, that is in that part of this book. An example of this is perhaps offered by a man called Michael Lapsley who was sent a letter bomb in South Africa just as apartheid uh, was coming to an end. Michael Lapsley's an Anglican priest and monk, and obviously he's given the question of forgiveness a great deal of thought. Uh, this is um, Michael. So you can see very obviously that he doesn't have uh, his natural hands. Uh, you, it's not so obvious that he doesn't have one of his eyes. These were some of the damage inflicted by that letter bomb. Um, tragically, tragic, just at the end of the, uh, the apartheid era, and, uh, and they were ironically wrapped, the explosives were wrapped in religious magazines. Uh, so that it's just a horrible um, thing to begin to think about. <clears throat> 
Sometimes people, of course, ask him, has he forgiven the bomber? Uh, to which he replies, how can I? I don't know who the bomber was. At this stage, forgiveness is not on the table. He puts it, he says, it's, it's, it's an irrelevancy. No, nothing to engage with there. sees it as personal. But he goes on to uh, write this in something he's written. If one day someone rings my doorbell, and when I open the door says, I'm the person who sent you the letter bomb, will you forgive me? Now, forgiveness is on the table, once the encounter happens. Then, but what do I say, he asks. Yes, no, not yet. What I might say is this. Excuse me, sir, do you still make letter bombs? If the person was to say, oh no, uh, actually I work in the local children's hospital, then I might say, yes, I forgive you. However, what follows on from this in Michael's imaginary scenario, as he calls it, is also important. We sit and drink tea together, and I'd say, although I've forgiven you, I still don't have hands. I still only have one eye, and my eardrums are damaged. I will live forever with the consequences of what you did, which means that I will need assistance for the rest of my life. Will you help pay for that? Not as a condition of my forgiveness, but as part of reparation and restitution in a way that's possible. Of course, this is hypothetical. The meeting has never happened. For Lapsley, it matters that the man is no longer making letter bombs. It also matters that he's now doing good work, spending his time healing rather than harming. Some people feel that he's not generous enough in his forgiving attitude. And this makes me wonder where they are coming from. If it is the total forgiveness model of R.T. Kendall, for instance, then it's relevant to note, as I've heard Michael say in person, actually I'm not overwhelmed by resentment, bitterness, or anger, and I don't seek to avenge myself. So he's not troubled by all this. He's troubled by pain and the issues caused by his disabilities. But he doesn't see coming to terms with his own feelings as worthy of the word forgiveness. He doesn't see forgiveness as something that becomes a duty for a person because they've been hurt, but a possibility for someone who has admitted to and repented of inflicting harm on another. This is more in line with a quotation from Luke's gospel mentioned earlier. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there's repentance, if there is repentance, if you stop making bombs and start helping children, then it's time for people to think about forgiving you. In an encyclopedic survey of recent writing about forgiveness, the American Jesuit James Voice suggests that there is what he calls violence, hard and soft violence, not in the issues that give rise for the need for forgiveness, but in some of the writing about forgiveness around this particular issue of uh, repentance. And he also suggests that philosophers who are insisting on the priority of repentance are operating a circular argument. He also contrasts their desire for true or just forgiveness with a completely different approach of continental philosophy, which values and seek, seeks pure forgiveness, a unilateral and generous act, so generous and unilateral that for the continental philosophers, it itself becomes impossible if someone has repented and changed themselves, or it is seen to be in the service of social or political reconciliation. They see it, forgiveness as a very pure thing which can serve no utilitarian function and not be conditioned by any, um, any actions or words at all. It's the approach of uh, Jacques Derrida and others who see such radical and pure forgiveness as profoundly paradoxical. And argues, uh, they argue that when it happens, it's a kind of madness. That's Derrida's words. So um, I've just done this little thing to sort of distinguish between the two. So the... Uh, Anglophone philosophers are very interested in just forgiveness, justice, which is interactive. It happens after 
uh, not only after offense, but after repentance, someone has manifestly changed. It is therefore reasonable. It is purposeful. It serves uh, the good of the community, as, as it were. And uh, it's rational as well. By contrast, the pure forgiveness uh, that the continental philosophers are interested in is unilateral. It's a decision made by a victim survivor. I will forgive. I am forgiving. I have forgiven. All there in like that, existential as it were. It's therefore unprompted. It's radical. Doesn't serve an end, uh, and it is mad. I'm not obviously going to ask you um, to choose between the two. Um, but it's really important to, to, I think, if you're interested in forgiveness, know that both these thought worlds are alive uh, and well at the moment. The situation in which we find ourselves when talking about forgiveness, then, is both practically difficult and intellectually contested. The word itself seems to have a high moral value, and yet sometimes forgiveness seems quite impossible. So a very good thing, but can't be done. For some, it's this very impossibility which makes forgiveness so marvellous. Whereas for others, the impossibility is ethical, and so non-forgiveness is important, an important if costly stance to take when it wouldn't be right or just or good to forgive. <coughs> the, these aren't the only problems uh, with forgiveness. Uh, and I said, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to touch briefly on the question of God forgiving now. It's a major aspect of Christian believing that uh, God forgives people their sins. It's an article in the Apostles' Creed, sandwiched in uh, at the end between the communion of saints and the resurrection of the body. It's a creedal belief. The question of whether or not it's right or just for God to forgive human beings is the question of atonement. And although there are di many different theories of this, the general idea is that through the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the claims of justice are met, so that God is thereafter free to forgive any and all sins, and humans are free to seek and accept the forgiveness of God without having to answer the claims of justice in their own case. I should say, as it were, in the celestial court. It doesn't mean that people are free of the temporal uh, courts and the claims of earthly justice, as it, as it were. But you don't need to put yourself right with God if you've done wrong, which you will have done. That's what's been done for you, and the whole religion is a matter of accepting and fitting in with that kind of ethic, which, of course, leads to the idea that you must be generally forgiving because you yourself uh, have been forgiven at a great cost. Human beings can't earn God's forgiveness. They can only receive it as a gift. On the other hand, as the Church of England booklet, this one, uh, argues, real repentance is required of the perpetrator of abuse in the confessional. And that means a willingness to subject oneself to the law of the land and the disciplines of safeguarding that are intended to reduce the likelihood of reoffending. God doesn't forgive people simply to cleanse their consciences before the next episode of abuse. It's really obvious to state but also important to state. The discussion of God's forgiveness has been going on an extremely long time, and many millions of words have been spent on it, but I'm not going to, not going to say much about it uh, today. That's because I want to move on to another vexed and contemporary question in the area of forgiveness, and that is the question of self-forgiveness, which is uh, an increasingly uh, interesting uh, question and reality. Let me give this a bit of uh, context. In 2005, think about how long that ago that was, not that long ago, 2005, the first ever handbook of forgiveness was published. If it wasn't such a big book, I would have brought it with me today to wave it at you. Its subject is the art and science of forgiving. It runs to 600 pages, and it's a book that would, <coughs> would have been unimaginable a decade before. Over 70 authors contributed. There are 33 chapters, uh, one of which is a 40-page, small print, forgiveness bibliography, listing many scientific papers on the subject. 
Now, a book that looks very much like a sequel to that book, which came out in 2005, is The Handbook of the Psychology of Self-Forgiveness. This came out in 2017. It's not quite as big. It runs to 350 uh, pages, and its focus is clearly psychological. The people who are responsible for this book take the view that self-forgiveness self is one method by which people process self-condemnation in the aftermath of perceived wrongdoing or failure. The focus in the book is not on the rights and wrongs of forgiving yourself, but on its intractability and complexity. Psychologists are, of course, interested in everyday behaviour, but they're even more interested in extreme and difficult uh, behaviours and are, of course, concerned to help people towards good mental health. These factors have all informed the sort of research that, means, that has been conducted and the guidance that's been given in this area of self-forgiveness. Now, my own feelings about self-forgiveness have developed over the years. Uh, when I wrote uh, this book called Healing Agony, which came out in 2012, I took the view that self-forgiveness was a mistaken phrase and that a more helpful and accurate one was self-acceptance. My view here wasn't, wasn't entirely my own idea. It wasn't, in fact, it wasn't my own thought at all. I'd read a, a very uh, persuasive intellectual academic paper in the Journal of Religion and Health, that had identified four serious problems with the notion of self-forgiveness, in addition to the observation that there is no rationale for it in traditional religion, as they put it. But the case against self-forgiveness runs something like this. Uh, it encourages an unhealthy splitting of the self. There is a conflict of interest, uh, so to speak, between the self that judges and the self that forgives. Self-forgiveness encourages a narcissistic focus on the self and that the interpersonal, and, interpersonal forgiveness and self-forgiveness involve different psychological processes. Therefore, they said, don't call it forgiveness. Call it acceptance. It's just about living with yourself, as it were. And I, I was reasonably persuaded by that. Uh, and I was also concerned that if self-forgiveness became a thing, as it were, caught on as a, as a, as a concept that works, then for many people it would become uh, the forgiveness of first resort, therefore robbing interpersonal forgiveness of its place and, uh, and moralising power. So Michael Lapsley's uh, bomber uh, wouldn't need to go and ring his doorbell and ask him whether or not uh, he would care to forgive him because he, he would have forgiven himself uh, some while ago. It seemed to me that that was not a helpful way to go. Because there is real moralizing, real <coughs> ennobling in this idea of interpersonal forgiveness. <coughs> People, um, which essentially has two um, movements in this way of thinking about it, the post-repentance kind. The first movement is that was terribly wrong and a mutual acknowledgement of that, followed by uh, a view that together we can somehow get through this and beyond it to some sort of continued relationship in which the pain and resentment of inflicted suffering is met by regret efforts at repair and resolve not to repeat. Although that never happens in a perfect way, doesn't mean to say that model uh, doesn't have some good qualities to it. And this isn't the sort of thing that can happen within an individual. It only makes sense in a relationship, even if a very, very tenuous one. But once we recognize that this is a form, but not the only form of interpersonal forgiveness, then it does become easier and more positive to imagine self-forgiveness. So I've been arguing here that there is not one pure, true, or ideal form of forgiveness, rather many forms, all of which have things in common, but none of which should be judged in terms of one of the others. An implication of this in terms of self-forgiveness is that the question is no longer 
Is self-forgiveness fundamentally a cheap cop-out when interpersonal forgiveness feels too difficult? But can there be some kind of intrapsychic process or dynamic that is reasonably called self-forgiveness in its own right? And one way of framing this is by asking whether we can identify differences between self-acceptance and self-forgiveness. My feeling now is that it can make good sense to talk about self-forgiveness. And a healthy form of self-forgiveness uh, would be something like this. The subject recognises that what they did was wrong. I have a slide on this. Um, recognise that what they did was, was wrong, that it caused suffering and pain, that in doing this I've been disrespectful of others. That I regret this. I seek to put things right. I resolve not to do it again. And, and this is the next step that be, this becomes uh, self-forgiveness, I will not punish myself interminably for what I did wrong. And obviously there, there are circumstances in which that could be an alternative to engaging with the person you've harmed, but there are also circumstances where it is actually impossible to the, engage with the person you have harmed, um, for instance, if they are dead or you don't know who they are or, or, or many kinds of circumstances. I think that forgiveness is the right word to use here, not because the subject splits itself into a good self and a bad self, with a good self uh, forgiving the bad self in the place of the victim or in place of God. It's rather because the intention and trajectory is to move on from a hurtful episode or series of events in such a way that they are acknowledged as wrong, harmful, and inexcusable, but that the badness of them the badness of them doesn't overdetermine the future. And that, in a way, is one of the ways in which I think uh, it's helpful to think about forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is something, some exchange or move within or around the self or in a relationship that means that the badness of the future, that of the past, doesn't overdetermine uh, the future. So it is an injection of freedom into the situation. And I suppose that's one of the reasons that I feel uh, that it is really problematic to muddle forgiveness up with moral imperatives. And it's more important to create the space in which people can genuinely forgive. That's not to say that I don't believe that, that forgiveness should be uh, valued and prized and esteemed in a community. It should be a value, but that's not the same thing as to say it is an imperative. Just because someone has suffered terribly, they now have this further uh, problem, as it were, or conundrum, a thrust upon them. The point about forgiveness is that bad is overcome by good, that evil and suffering are transcended, and that a new and better future is opened up as people move away from the living hell that can be shaped either by the victim's resentment going toxic and becoming bitterness, or hatred, or leading to vengeful plans and behaviours, all that is the way in which you know, you can, you, you've been hurt and it goes worse for you and for everyone else, or the living hell of <coughs> the perpetrator's guilt and shame becoming closed circles of misery for those who sincerely regret their actions and genuinely care about the future of their victims. Forgiveness is that which takes place by whatever means when the claims of both justice and mercy are honoured in the aftermath of culpable, responsible hurt and moral harm. And the natural course of harm leading, natural I put in inverted commas, the natural, the apparently natural course of harm leading to more harm is somehow averted. So my concluding points are uh, along the following lines, uh, summarising where I've got to. Uh, as I've said, there is no, no one form of forgiveness. There are strong uh, models of forgiveness, but I, I mean, this is, this is kind of insight I, I came to fairly recently thinking about this, because so much uh, of the writing about forgiveness is battling, academic writing is battling with people who see it differently. And it seemed to me that if we just ease up on that a bit, then the whole subject becomes much more tractable and actually much more respectful 
uh, of the hugely contextual way in which forgiveness unfolds. Believe me, when people uh, engage with forgiveness, they are not following a textbook. I mean, this idea that you can tell people how to forgive works in the primary school playground, you know, when someone's hair has been pulled or whatever, now say you're sorry and get, get on with life. But it doesn't transfer into the really, really difficult situations. Also, something I haven't said is, uh, is an aspect of the most harming kinds of hurt is I think that they sometimes remove from us that very part of ourself with which we might be generous and forgive. So this, this, some, this is the impact of trauma or being shattered by what we've heard, or heard of. And there are cases in which people have spent a great deal of time uh, thinking about forgiveness, even being active researchers and theorists in this area. Something will happen in their life, and then they're bold enough to say, uh, some while, you know, two or three years later, do you know what? The word forgiveness never even came into my head for the first two weeks after. In one case, I'm thinking of the murder of my mother although their life's work had been on forgiveness. This is, and so I think it's really important that those who are interested in forgiveness are also equally interested in what harm and damage does to people. Because unless you are, you really have got very little to say about where it goes. And that's why it's so important that in the ecclesiastical world, the first thing that church leaders should not be saying is, now people have been abused, what do you think about forgiveness? But people have survived abuse, what do you have to say to us? What can, we, what can we learn from your experience of that? What do we need to know? And indeed, how will people... Because there's always the possibility that narrating uh, can be healing here. And certainly there's a reality that not to be acknowledged in your suffering is to further aggravate the suffering. Nice point that Michael Lapsley made. At least I'm, I was fairly famous, and so my, so my suffering was acknowledged. It's part of the journey for him. So everyday forgiveness and post-traumatic forgiveness need to be considered differently. I was just making that point in a rather more long-winded way for you there. Self-forgiveness can legitimately be regarded as a form of forgiveness. I hope I have persuaded you of that. And this is my, my, really my view, that if forgiveness emerges when justice and mercy coexist as values, if you get rid of mercy, you're not going to have forgiveness. But if you get rid of justice, you're not going to have forgiveness either. You're just going to have laissez-faire putting up with things. You need both. Uh, and I don't believe with, with the continental philosophers that forgiveness is uh, at its best when it's mad and serves no purpose. I do believe that it serves the hope of a peaceful future. It's a strange business, forgiveness. It, it fits into our culture in, in a complicated way. <coughs> Uh, and puzzling way because of the way in which it's wrapped up with religion. But it's one of the very good things about what's happened in the last 30 years is that it is opening up in a general way, uh, and I believe that that can be a significant help to us in our various peacemaking projects, uh, personally uh, as well as politically. And on that point, I end. Thank you very much.